Hey, it's Medicosis Perfectionellus, where medicine makes perfect sense. Let's continue our nerve physiology series. In previous videos, we have talked about the strength duration curve. Today, it's time for the resting membrane potential, where the inside of your neuron is negative, and therefore the outside is more positive relative to the inside. Everything is relative. If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. Why is this eyepiece larger than this one? Because it's relative. So we have discussed the cell membrane physiology, osmosis, autonomic nervous system physiology, and now it's nerve physiology. Let's start by answering the questions of the last video. Let's match between column A and column B according to this graph. If you look at the measuring unit, all of them are milliseconds, aka duration, except this one is milliampere. And for the real base, which is the electricity, is D. Rio means electricity, base means the minimal. So this is the threshold stimulus, the minimal or the lowest current intensity that can excite your neuron. How about C? Well, C is the duration of the Rio base. Oh, what do you call the duration of the Rio base? I will call it utilization time. Got it. If D is the Rio base, what is this point right here? This is double the Rio base. Okay. What is the duration or the time of the double the real base? It's called chronaxi. So chronaxi is B. Now let's talk about A. As you see here, this is the maximum strength of the stimulus, giving you the lowest duration. And A is a time. So this is the minimal time. Question 16. If the amount of ECF calcium decreased, the chronaxi will... Well, let's talk about this. Calcium decreased. As I've told you gazillion times before, calcium is contra-excitability. When the calcium in the serum decreases, nerve excitability will increase. When the nerve excitability increases, the time needed to excite the nerve will decrease. So chronaxi will go down. It's one of the most difficult questions. But hey, medicosis, why is calcium contra-excitability? We'll talk about that later. Let's review the nuggets of medicine. Nugget number one, why do we need the action potential? Because the action potential is everything. Inside your body, the nerve impulse is unidirectional. The nerve impulse starts at the axon hillock, the most excitable part of the axon. Nugget number four, during rest, aka the resting membrane potential or the polarized state, the inside of the membrane is more negative compared to the outside. However, upon activation, Upon depolarization, upon reversal of polarity, the inside becomes more positive because sodium is coming in. Sodium is positive, sodium influx will make the inside of the membrane more positive. Nugget number five, local anesthetics will affect type C fibers before they affect type B, before type A. Because type C is the thinnest, it's also unmyelinated. How about hypoxia? No, hypoxia will affect you the most if you are metabolically active and if you are thick and far away from the artery. And that's why type A fibers are the most affected by hypoxia. If I develop hypoxia, my type A fibers will suffer first. Nugget number seven is a compilation of the previous two nuggets. Susceptible to pressure or hypoxia affects type A fibers more than B, more than C. But to local anesthetics, C is affected the most, followed by B, then A. How do we measure nerve excitability clinically? Chronaxi, baby. What does chrono mean? Time. Therefore, chronaxi is the time, not the strength of the stimulus. Shut up. The time, the duration, the time needed by a current whose intensity is double the real base. Why not use just real base? Why do you need double the real base? Because I gotta overcome the resistance of the skin. If you don't like it, I can remove the skin and do the test on your naked nerve. How would you like that? Here's the most difficult definition ever. Membrane potential, define it. Uh, it's the potential of the membrane. Oh, no kidding. It's the difference between the inside and the outside surface of the membrane. Of course, membrane potential is responsible for excitability. We use the CRO to measure it. Number nine, we have three forms of membrane potential. Okay, if I'm resting, we call this the resting membrane potential, of course. Upon stimulation, if you give me threshold, I'll give you an action potential. But if you give me sub-threshold or a sub-minimal stimulus, I will not give you action potential because it's all or none law. I can give you local response. Which reminds me of Friedrich Nietzsche when he said, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. 
But metacosis says what doesn't cause an action potential will at least lead to a local response. How many people will quote Nietzsche in a physiology lecture? Not many. Please don't ever forget nugget number four. Okay, so during rest, the inside is negative. But during activation, the inside becomes positive. Here is the action potential in its most basic form. Here is you during rest, which is negative 70. Who is responsible for the resting membrane potential? Well, uh, the polarized state is caused by the potassium efflux through the inward rectifier potassium channels. When potassium is leaving, when the positive is leaving, the inside is left to be more negative, negative 70. Okay. Upon activation, sodium is gonna rush into the neuron. Sodium is positive. When positive comes into the cell, you get an upward spike like this, and you go from negative 70 to positive 40 millivolts. Please don't ever say volts. Volt will kill you millivolt. And now I have reached the apex, the zenith of the action potential. Now let's go back down to earth. Repolarization, baby. What's gonna happen? Uh, stop the influx of the sodium. And then open the potassium channel so that potassium can leave. When the positive is leaving, I'm becoming more negative like this. But sometimes I overshoot. Instead of just stopping at negative 70, I reach negative 80, negative 85, etc. So this is called hyperpolarization. But let's bring it up a little to reach negative 70. Who's gonna bring it up a little? Well, take some of that potassium and just ram it inside the neuron through the inward rectifying potassium channel. What is the value of the resting membrane potential? Ah, it's about negative 70 millivolts. For what? What are you talking about here? The medium-sized neurons. Okay, but if your neurons are large and thick, or if you're talking about large skeletal muscle fibers, it's about negative 90. Translation, there is more potassium efflux. What if I'm not excitable, such as a red blood cell or epithelium? Well, if you're not excitable, you're not dishing the potassium out. Therefore, you're just negative 10, negative 20. These are some young kids. What is the definition of resting membrane potential? It is the potential across the membrane during rest. No, duh. Oh, medicine is so hard and it doesn't make sense. Oh, shut up. I'm just reading the words backwards. During the resting membrane potential or during the polarized state, the inside is more negative compared to the outside. Please don't say the inside is only negative and the outside is only positive. Stop it, okay? The inside has negative and positive, but it has more negative when you compare it to the outside. Okay, what causes the resting membrane potential? What causes the negative 70? What causes the inside to be more negative relative to the outside during rest? Two things. Number one, selective permeability of the membrane to sodium and potassium, especially potassium. Number two, the sodium-potassium ATPase pump, a prime example of the primary active transport. Which one is more important? The selective permeability, of course. This accounts for about 95% of the resting membrane potential. But I will start by talking about the sodium-potassium ATPase because we have discussed it before. Here's your beautiful cell membrane. Here's the inside of the cell and here's the outside of the cell, okay? In the ICF, what is more predominant or more prevalent? Anything that starts with a P. Potassium, phosphate, proteins, and magnesium because it's found in the supernova. Okay, what is more predominant than the ECF, extracellular fluid, anything else? Sodium, chloride, calcium, bicarbonate, uh, who cares? The cell membrane transport is either passive or active. Passive is called diffusion, active is called the active transport, and you have two subtypes. Carrier active transport and vesicular active transport. Active carrier, active vesicular. Let's talk about the active carrier. I have primary active and secondary active. Primary active, I am exerting the energy here. Secondary active, well, I still need energy, but I am not exerting it here. I am dependent on the energy exerted at the primary. Can you give me an example of primary active transport? Sure, it's the sodium-potassium ATPase pump. It's ATPase because it has ATPase activity, breaking down the ATP into ADP and phosphate. And of course, when you break that bond, you release energy. That's why it needs energy. Okay, have you noticed that sodium is the major cation outside the cell? Yeah, have you ever wondered why? It is thanks to the sodium potassium ATPase. It's dishing potassium to the outside and bringing potassium to the inside. And that's why sodium is more predominant on the outside, potassium is more dominant 
the inside. Chloride is the major anion in the ECF. Uh, ever wondered why? Sure, because since sodium is more predominant on the outside, sodium is positive, chloride is negative, they will attract each other to make salt. How about phosphate? Why is phosphate the major anion in the ICF inside the cell? Because you need phosphate for ATP, and ATP is made in the mitochondria, which is an intracellular structure. Medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. Actions have consequences, and so do pumps. The consequences of the sodium-potassium pump include you have more sodium outside, you have more potassium inside, there is more positivity outside. Why is this? Because you are dishing out three sodiums and dishing in two potassiums. In other words, it's as if you are pushing out one positive. Okay, so when you're pushing out one positive, it's as if you're pushing in one negative, according to the law of electroneutrality. You're making the outside surface more positive, and conversely, you're making the inside surface more negative. Hashtag resting membrane potential is negative 70. And this is how the sodium potassium ATPs pump contributes to the resting membrane potential. So what are the two forces that contribute to the RMP? Number one, selective permeability. Number two, the sodium potassium ATPs. Which one is more important? Selective permeability, of course. Okay, can you tell me what do you mean by selective permeability? Sure, it's a permeability that happens to be selective. No kidding. What do you mean? I mean the membrane is permeable to certain things, but impermeable to other things. This is selective permeability. The membrane is permeable to potassium, 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 and some sodium, and it's impermeable to proteins, organic anions, and those big substances. Okay, so what's happening during rest? During rest, two things are happening. Potassium efflux, and then potassium efflux, and then potassium efflux, and more potassium efflux, and some sodium influx. Which one is more important? Of course, you see this? Potassium efflux happens way, 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 way more often than the sodium influx during rest. Okay, by how much? Well, the amount of potassium efflux is about 20 to 100 times greater than that of the sodium influx. So, of course, potassium efflux is more important than sodium influx. And therefore, potassium efflux contributes more to the resting membrane potential than the sodium influx. Since sodium influx is not that important during rest, let's just ignore it and focus on the potassium efflux. When a positive is leaving the cell, the inside of the cell is becoming more negative. Easy enough. Why is potassium leaving? Why is some sodium entering? Well, it's a balance between the concentration gradient and the electrical gradient. Let's lump them together in one phrase and call it the electrochemical gradient. Beautimus. At equilibrium, if you measure the potassium inside to the potassium outside and get a ratio, you'll find that the potassium inside is about 140. Outside, of course, you have measured it before clinically. What's the normal potassium in the plasma? Between 3.5 and 5. Let's call it 4 milliequivalents per liter. 140 over 4 is about 35. Translation. Potassium inside is 35 times greater than the potassium outside. So when I have more potassium inside than outside, do you think potassium is gonna go out or come in? Well, according to concentration gradient, it's gonna leave the cell potassium efflux. That's why. Conversely, sodium inside to the sodium outside ratio is about 14 to 140 because this is the normal sodium. In the serum, you get 0.1, okay. So you can call this to make it easy, one over 10. So you have more sodium outside to the inside, and that's why sodium is coming into the cell according to the concentration gradient. The resting membrane potential has another name, the polarized state, where the inside is more negative and the outside is more positive. Who is responsible for the polarized state? It's the potassium efflux. If you wanna make the mnemonic more sophisticated, the polarized attitude is caused by potassium abandoning the cell. What's the definition of the resting membrane potential? It's the potential difference across the membrane during rest. The inside is more negative and the outside is more positive, relatively speaking. Who caused the resting membrane potential? Selective permeability and selective permeability and selective permeability and selective permeability and the sodium potassium ATPase. Now let's add some nuggets. During rest, potassium is leaving some sodium is entering. Which one is more important? Of course, potassium is more important. Good job. Next, 
What are the forces that cause the resting membrane potential? Selective permeability, selective permeability, selective permeability, selective permeability, selective permeability, and some sodium potassium ATPase bomb. Which one is more important? Of course, selective permeability is more important. How did we know that potassium efflux is more important than sodium influx during rest? And how did we know that the selective permeability is more important than the pump during growth? Okay, Metacosis, it's because you said so. Well, that's a logical fallacy known as the argument from authority. I want a scientific evidence. Lucky for you, two doofuses have gathered the evidence for us. The first one, Nernest equation to explain why the potassium efflux is more important than the sodium influx during rest. The second person is Goldman who explains why the selective permeability is way, 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 way more important than the pump when it comes to the resting membrane potential. In the next video, we'll talk about the Nernest equation and the Goldman equation. But hey, Minikosis, these are not doofuses. These are scientists. Have some respect for yourself. Yes, ma'am. Who is responsible for the resting membrane potential? Basically, potassium efflux. The polarized state is caused by the potassium efflux. Okay, if you want to be super sophisticated, you can actually calculate this mathematically. As you see here, it's dependent on sodium, potassium, calcium, and chloride. But which one is the greatest? It's the potassium. So if you do mathematical calculation, you'll find that this portion is way, way, way higher than this, 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 or this. Vm is the potential difference because V is for volt. If you remember physics, the potential difference is measured in volts. So it's V across the membrane. G Sodium is the conductance of sodium across the membrane, conductance of potassium, etc. GT is the membrane conductance, which is the opposite or the reciprocal of membrane resistance. The greater the resistance, the lower the conductance and vice versa. And E is called the equilibrium potential. You didn't need to memorize this. Just remember, potassium is the most important force during rest. Now, my favorite part of the lecture, the clinical integration. We'll talk about hypokalemia, hyperkalemia, and a disease known as familial periodic paralysis. During resting membrane potential, imagine that I have hypokalemia, which means less potassium outside. Okay. Decreased potassium concentration in the ECF will lead to what? What's going to happen to the electrochemical gradient? Oh, now I have less potassium outside, which means it's as if I have more potassium on the inside. This will lead to more potassium efflux, and therefore it will leave the inside of the membrane more negative. So instead of negative 70, it will become negative 90, negative 100, etc. On the other hand, hyperkalemia, oh, you have more potassium on the outside than the inside. Oh, it's making the gradient lower, decreasing the potassium efflux, making the inside more positive. Let's follow these two pieces of logic to their absurd conclusion, aka reductio ad absurdo. If the resting membrane potential is becoming more negative thanks to hypokalemia, what's gonna happen? Oh, you are pushing the membrane away from the threshold. Okay, because at a certain point, let's say this is negative 70, okay? And the threshold is here. So if you make me negative 100, you are forcing me away from the threshold, making it harder for me to activate and to depolarize. Oh, this will decrease the action potential. It will decrease depolarization. And that's why hypokalemia leads to muscle weakness. Because if there is no nerve excitation, there is no muscle contraction, which reminds me of a used car salesman who said to me, no cash, no problem. No action potential in the nerve, no contraction in the muscle. Conversely, hyperkalemia made the resting membrane potential more positive, closer to the threshold, making it easier for me to ascend in the ascending limb of depolarization. More depolarization equals more muscle contraction, and that's why hyperkalemia can cause cardiac arrest. It can lead to tachyarrhythmia, which can kill you. This is one of the most important slides in medicine. Sodium problems will lead to CNS problems, but calcium, which is potassium, problems will lead to cardiac problems. If I have hyponatremia, I can suffer from mental status abnormalities. If I have hypernatremia, I can also suffer from mental status abnormalities. If I have hypokalemia, my heart can suffer. And if I have hyperkalemia, my heart can also suffer because my heart is a muscle. The cardiac myocytes, some of them are specialized nerve cells. If you don't believe me, consider this. Let's say you have a patient with hypokalemia. What can you see on EKG? 
If you ask a sophisticated medical student, they will say, oh, I see U waves. Yeah, but that's not it. You can see gazillion things. Prominent U waves can happen. T wave flattening can happen. ST segment changes can happen. Hypokalemia can lead to QT prolongation, which will lead to prolonged QT interval, aka long QT syndrome, which can increase your risk of torsa de pointe. This can also lead to sudden cardiac death eventually. Hyperkalemia is even more dangerous than hypokalemia. You get peak T wave, this is the earliest sign. And then the worse the hyperkalemia, you will go down the tubes. So you get flattened P wave, PR prolongation, adioventricular rhythm, widened QRS complex, deep S wave, sine wave, pediventricular fibrillation, cardiac arrest during diastole and you will die. How do you treat hyperkalemia? What's the first step? The first step is to protect the heart. How do you protect the heart? by giving calcium glucose. Why would you give calcium to protect the heart? Well, because calcium is contra-excitability. The greater the calcium, the lower the cardiac excitability. Oh, that makes sense. So we are not giving calcium to lower the potassium. We're giving calcium to protect the heart because calcium is contra-excitability. Medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. Let's talk about familial periodic paralysis. Why do you call it familial? Because it runs in families. Why is it periodic? Because it's episodic, because it's paroxysmal. It comes in attacks, and these attacks are usually after meals. We can call this postprandial hypokalemia. Potassium is dropping after meals. When you get hypokalemia, what do you get? Decreased potassium in the ECF. This increases the electrochemical gradient, increasing potassium efflux, making the inside of the membrane more negative. More negative, you are pushing me away from the threshold, decreasing the depolarization, decreasing nerve excitability, decreasing muscle contraction, and that's why it's called paralysis, because it's muscle weakness, especially postprandial. How do you treat these patients? Give them potassium, so lots of bananas, juices, etc. You can also give them potassium sparing diuretics, to prevent hypokalemia and to try to cause hyperkalemia to counteract the hypokalemia. Let's review hypokalemia from Picmonic. Hypokalemia is represented by the hippo banana, because banana has potassium. What is the normal serum potassium? Between 3.5 and 5 milliequivalents per liter. So hypo, when it's less than 3.5. Lower than 3.5. And here's the tree to remember 3. And here's high 5 to remember the 0.5. Consequences of hypokalemia include muscle weakness. Look at this weak muscle. Arrhythmia. Look at this abnormal rhythm. When your muscles are not contracting, you get ileus because you have smooth muscles in your gut. When they are not contracted, you get functional obstruction known as ileus. You also get hyporeflexia because your muscles are not contracting. Here's the hippo with the reflex hammer. How do I treat hypokalemia? Well, if the patient likes potassium, give the patient potassium. You can give it by intravenous infusion or you can give it orally with food. It's very important to monitor the respiratory status because your diaphragm is a muscle. Your intercostal muscles are muscles. They need nerve excitability. If you have hypokalemia, they can be toast. Of course, if you get respiratory paralysis, you can die. I love Picmonic. Question of the day. The figure below represents a neuron. You don't say. Which of the following regions has the highest concentration of sodium channels per surface area, per square micrometer? Let me know the answer in the comment section. You will find the answer in the next video in this glorious playlist called Physiology. If you want to learn more about hyponatremia, hypernatremia, hypokalemia, hyperkalemia, hypocalcemia, hypercalcemia, hypochloremia, hyperchloremia, etc., check out my electrolytes course at medicosisperfectionetics.com and download it today. I have another course for CNS pharmacology and a third course for acid-based disturbances. And for the next 17 students, you can get a 25% discount towards anything on my website. Just use promo code SAFE25. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my premium courses. Go to Picmonic for more than a thousand animated medical mnemonics. In the next video, we'll talk about the Nernest equation and Goldman equation. Thank you for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionaires, where medicine makes perfect sense.